scientists have made a staggering discovery. A planet circling the sun's nearest neighbor with temperatures that could allow liquid water to flow. What will it take to go there? To explore it? The answer is speed. Laser-driven spaceships. Anti-matter engines. Warp drive right out of science fiction. How far? How fast can our technology take us? It's a journey that has lasted a century. A spacecraft approaches its destination, a planet beyond our solar system, and a future beyond our imagination. Touchdown will mark a milestone in our eternal quest to expand our horizons, to explore and to survive. It's not the first time we've struck out into the void against all odds. For much of our history, the oceans were the great unknown. Several thousand years ago, a seafaring culture emerged in the Southwest Pacific. Riding ocean and wind currents, the Polynesians sailed east, navigating by the stars, the moon, and the sun. Over centuries of time, they claimed the Pacific Ocean, island by distant island. It was one of the most expansive migrations in human history. Their furthest reach, Easter Island, was over 2,000 kilometers from the nearest land. Today, we have begun to reach beyond our planetary shores. Across distances so vast, we measure them in light years. That's how far light travels in a year, almost 10 trillion kilometers. Our roadmap leads us out into the southern sky. There, a little over four light years away, you'll find our sun's nearest neighbors, a dim red dwarf star called Proxima Centauri. And a pair of sun-like stars called Alpha Centauri. Go beyond them and you've entered the local bubble a giant empty region cleared of gas by a star that exploded long ago.
Within this bubble, 50 light years from Earth, are 150 stars bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. Nestled among them are 2,000 smaller stars, visible only with a powerful telescope. How many have planets? Could any serve as stations on our way out to explore the galaxy? Our first stop, no doubt, is a planet orbiting around the star nearest to Earth, Proxima Centauri. About one-third larger than Earth, it's a very different kind of planet. One side, facing away from its star, is dark and freezing. The other side, facing inward, is forever bright and warm. Could life flourish here? Could humans survive? The key is whether there's an atmosphere and water on the surface. These would be signs that there's a climate and temperatures moderate enough to support life. If Proxima b or any other planet in the solar neighborhood proves to be habitable, the call will certainly be heard to mount an expedition to see and explore it up close. But to get there in the short course of a human lifetime, we'll take whole new types of spacecraft we have yet to build, whole new designs that can propel us to extreme speeds. The discovery of Proxima b was part of an intensive campaign to find worlds like Earth in the neighborhood of our sun. Increasingly, the hunt for planets combines the enormous light-gathering power of giant new observatories on the ground with a growing fleet of telescopes in space. More than just identifying the presence of planets, these instruments allow us to measure surface temperatures, detect atmospheres, and look for the chemical signatures of life. Astronomers are devising whole new tests of habitability. One group used the Hubble Space Telescope to probe a series of seven planets recently found orbiting an ultra-cool dwarf star 40 light years away, called TRAPPIST-1. Each of these planets is roughly the size of Earth. Three orbit within the habitable zone, at just the right distance from the parent star and with the right temperature to support liquid water. What are the chances they actually harbor oceans and rivers and lakes? Red dwarf stars like TRAPPIST-1 are known to emit large and violent flares. Over time, solar radiation acts to split molecules of water in a planet's atmosphere. Hydrogen atoms liberated in the split, then waft into space, leaving the oxygen to bind with rocks on the surface. This same process has been documented on the planet Mars. In its early years, there is thought to have been enough water to carve networks of river and lake beds. Over time, these stores of water disappeared, along with Mars's chance of nurturing life. To find out whether the planets of TRAPPIST-1 have been stripped of their water, astronomers measured the amount of ultraviolet light striking them, an indication of their exposure to solar flares. They found that the innermost planets are bathed in ultraviolet light and are most likely bone dry.
By contrast, the outermost planets have been spared the radiation. It's possible they have kept the stores of water acquired during their birth, whether liquid or ice. Based on a statistical analysis of solar systems discovered so far, one study estimates that there is at least one planet like Earth within 20 light years. Astronomers may have already found it. Each night, in this control room at the La Silla Observatory in Chile, astronomers conduct the world's most intensive hunt for planets in the neighborhood of the Sun. They work with an older telescope, commissioned in the year 1977. It has a relatively small mirror at 3.6 meters in diameter. But it's outfitted with a spectrographic technology that allows astronomers to finely parse the light of nearby stars. It does this by recording subtle shifts in their light caused by the gravitational tug of planets. Among their targets is a star that lies just below the constellation of Leo, 11 light years from Earth. Ross 128 is a red dwarf star like Proxima Centauri. Orbiting this star within the habitable zone, Astronomers have found a planet slightly larger than Earth. Because the star is relatively quiescent, the planet may not have endured destructive blasts of radiation. In the coming years, astronomers will use powerful ground telescopes to probe the planet's atmosphere they are looking for the presence of biomarkers such as oxygen and other evidence of a habitable climate. They'll also look for clues to the early evolution of our own planet and ultimately for an answer to the age-old question, are we alone in the universe? Should we ever decide it's worth going there for a close-up look, we might want to wait. Ross 128 is actually moving toward us. In the blink of a cosmic eye, 79,000 years from now, it will become our sun's nearest neighbor. Proxima Centauri. TRAPPIST-1 and Ross-128 are among the first targets in what is shaping up to be the golden age of planet hunting. The transit exoplanet satellite TESS has found evidence of over 5,000 planets orbiting nearby stars that astronomers hope to scan in the coming years. Many are like those found around the star HD 21749, slightly smaller than our Sun, and 53 light years away. The surface of planet C likely hovers around 400 degrees Celsius. It's so close to the star that it whips around it every eight Earth days. Planet B is a gas giant 23 times the mass of Earth. Within a deep layer of clouds, temperatures average around 150 degrees Celsius. 
The sun-like star Pi Mensa hosts a planet twice the size of Earth. Its surface temperature is over 900 degrees Celsius. Then there's this planet, around the red dwarf star TOI 700. Roughly the size of Earth, it's tucked just inside the habitable zone of its parent star. Following up on data from TESS, planet hunters used the powerful detectors of the James Webb Space Telescope to confirm its first planet. At 99% the size of Earth, it orbits the red dwarf star LHS 475. This planet will no doubt be the subject of intensive study in coming years. Inevitably, the discovery of planets around nearby stars has spurred debate about the imperatives of interstellar missions. The physicist Stephen Hawking was one of a growing number of scientists concerned about a cloud of uncertainties surrounding Earth's future. Pollution. Overpopulation. War. Climate change and ecological collapse. We have no choice, they say but to develop the technologies needed to not only travel to other solar systems, but to survive in alien realms. The dream of settling distant worlds is as old as the rocket itself. Back in the early years of the 20th century, the Russian space visionary Konstantin Stolkovsky believed humans would one day ascend to the stars. They would evolve into a whole new species he called Homo Cosmicus. Tsiolkovsky laid out the physics of the rocket. His famous rocket equation describes the basic principle of acceleration. It's the force of mass expelled at high velocity out the back of a rocket versus the overall mass of the rocket. Decades later, in the 1960s, with the space age in full swing, another Russian scientist, Nikolai Kardashev, described spacefaring civilizations as the product of a long-range technological evolution. He defined level one as a planetary civilization with the ability to tap into energy equivalent to that of the sun striking our planet. At this basic level, a planetary civilization would exceed our current energy generating capacity by five orders of magnitude. It may take us centuries to advance that far. It may take thousands or even millions of years to reach level two, the ability to harness the energy equivalent of a star, or level three, the energy of a galaxy. In theory, a civilization with that degree of sophistication could wander the galaxy, mining raw materials from planetary bodies, while generating energy from technologies we can scarcely imagine. Advancing that far does not mean we can afford to abandon Earth. According to a recent rethinking of Kardashev's theories, 
Maintaining the health of our biosphere will be crucial to the development of interstellar technologies. In this view, interstellar flight will flow from successful efforts to solve humanity's growing energy needs with technologies that are more efficient, powerful, and safe. Indeed, radically more potent fuels and engines could even pose serious dangers to the very environments that allow us to develop and test them. In this way of thinking, to advance toward a planetary civilization means producing energy in ways that actually safeguard Earth. What leaps in science and engineering will interstellar technologies depend upon? How far and how fast can they take us? The speeds we can reach depend on the technologies we employ and the power that drives them. Power is often measured in joules, the amount needed to lift a 100 gram object one meter against Earth's gravity. The metabolism of an average person at rest produces 100 joules per second, or 100 watts. That's the same as a light bulb. An elite runner traveling at almost 40 kilometers per hour generates 1,500 watts. Using the technology of a bicycle, we use that same wattage to top 66 kilometers per hour. On the ground, this is our speediest machine. A race car can reach speeds of 350 kilometers per hour with an engine that converts the potential energy packed into gasoline, about 40 million joules per kilo, into the kinetic energy of motion. It's held back by friction from the road and the air. One way to fight friction soar into the upper atmosphere. The SR-71 Blackbird flies at 3,500 kilometers per hour, 10 times faster than a race car. As much power as a jet can muster, a full tank buys only a few hours of flight. Rocketing into space, is even less efficient. To rise into Earth orbit, a giant Saturn V rocket must hit 28,000 kilometers per hour, almost 10 times faster than a jet. But the faster it goes, the more fuel it burns, the more it has to carry. To get Apollo astronauts into space and on their way to the moon, a Saturn V rocket had to lug 16 times its weight in fuel. As inefficient as chemical rockets are, they have served the vast imperatives of the space age. Since the 1960s, We've used them to launch thousands of satellites for communications and military purposes, for studying the Earth and peering into space. And we've used rockets to send a succession of astronauts into Earth orbit. The now retired space shuttle 
served as a platform for research, for launching and servicing the Hubble Space Telescope, and for building the International Space Station. A successor to the Russian Mir and American Skylab stations, the International Space Station began to take shape in 1998. It has become the largest collaborative engineering project in human history. This sprawling structure hosts a complex arrangement of modules and nodes and a network of labs and living areas. Here, astronauts are learning to live for extended periods of time apart from the gravity, climate systems, and comforts of our home planet. From Earth, rockets deliver resupply missions up to six times each year. These unmanned capsules from Russia and the United States carry hundreds of meals, new equipment, and scientific experiments. The International Space Station has become a hub for zero-gravity science. At any given time, the crew is conducting pointed research into life support systems and preparing data for publication in science journals. Proponents of this work see it laying the groundwork for longer and more ambitious manned missions. There are a host of challenges to overcome. Beyond recycling waste and the internal atmosphere, life support systems must include the ability to grow food. On missions far beyond Earth, living compartments must protect against solar radiation and cosmic rays. Once these problems are solved, some proponents envision the construction of bases in orbit around the sun with factories or supply hubs to support a network of remote colonies. Whether we send people to explore Mars or to mine rare minerals on asteroids, we'll have to overcome the power and speed limits of the space age. Right now, because of the amount of fuel needed just to get into space, most long-distance spacecraft can only coast to their destinations. The twin Voyager spacecraft got around this by using the pull of Jupiter's gravity as a planetary slingshot. racing out at 62,000 kilometers per hour, more than double the speed of a Saturn V. Voyager 2 became the first spacecraft to exit the solar system. But as fast as it's going, it will need another 73,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri. To make long-distance space travel efficient, whether it's humans or robots making the journey, we'll have to reinvent the rocket. The search for faster, more advanced spacecraft began in the 1960s in the shadow of the nuclear arms race. Nuclear bombs release energy by splitting the atom. Imagine if that potential could be harnessed to propel a spacecraft. Scientists tested a whole new type of rocket, a vehicle propelled by small nuclear explosions. They envisioned an orbiting space station as the launch pad for the Orion spacecraft.
a series of controlled nuclear blasts set off behind the craft would accelerate it to 10% the speed of light. Orion would have been able to reach Proxima b in just over four decades of Earth time. Plans for this spacecraft never got off the ground. The technology was unproven and perhaps unsafe. In the 1970s, with interstellar flight still in their sights, a group of British engineers designed a 200-meter-long craft called Daedalus. It would use another type of nuclear power, fusion. That's the energy that lights up the sun, generated when gravity forces atoms together under immense heat and pressure. Just a gram of fusion fuel could yield energy in the range of 200 billion joules. The idea was to produce an extremely hot gas that would propel the craft by blasting it out the back. After accelerating through two stages, it could cruise along at 12% the speed of light. But this required Daedalus to carry more than 40,000 tons of fuel, and there'd be nothing left to slow it down once it approached its destination. As it flew past its target, at 129 million kilometers per hour, it would deploy a fleet of robotic explorers to go in for a look. Daedalus was never built, but the completeness of the design has inspired new generations of dreamers. Today, one group of scientists believes it may have a way to reach Proxima b more efficiently. The concept begins with a solar power generating station orbiting Earth. It's lined with lasers, each aimed at a tiny spacecraft, a futuristic version of that Polynesian sailboat. The force exerted by each laser beam is small, but together, in frictionless space, they can propel a space sail with staggering success to 20% the speed of light. In just 20 years, a fleet of laser-powered craft approaches Proxima b. They send their data, bouncing from one craft to the next, on a four-year return journey to Earth. If Proxima b proves a worthy destination, there are technologies on the drawing board that promise an even faster ride. What if we could tap into the stuff of science fiction? Antimatter. It's the product of high energy radiation that rips through our solar system. When cosmic rays smash into atoms in our upper atmosphere, they create a spray of particles of the opposite charge. If we can't capture antimatter particles in orbit, we may find a way to produce them on Earth. Down at CERN, the giant physics lab on the border of France and Switzerland, Scientists have been creating antimatter as a way of studying the underlying nature of our universe and how it emerged in the earliest moments of time. 
using the Large Hadron Collider. They accelerate atoms to nearly the speed of light and blast them together to release their fundamental constituents. But the antimatter yield is so small that the cost of producing just a gram's worth is estimated to be upwards of $100 trillion. And the stuff is so volatile that storing more than a few atoms at a time remains a significant challenge. Our ability to produce such an energy-dense fuel raises basic questions about whether interstellar flight is even possible. One thing's for sure, more Earth-friendly alternatives such as geothermal, solar, and wind won't transform us into a planetary civilization, and they simply don't pack enough explosive power to get us to Proxima Centauri. Antimatter might, provided we can learn to control and produce it in enough quantity. It is the most powerful fuel known, with about two billion times more energy per volume than conventional rocket fuel. In contemporary spacecraft designs, protons and antiprotons are isolated with magnetic fields. They're channeled in parallel to a propulsion chamber. Where they collide, the streams annihilate each other. The blast creates a high energy beam that pushes on a magnetic field within the craft, accelerating it forward. Though it would take only a thousandth of a gram to fly to Saturn, the craft would need to carry tons more to get up to interstellar speeds and reach Proxima Centauri within a human lifetime. Such a potent fuel brings serious hazards. The high temperatures produced by an antimatter engine would be enough to destroy the spacecraft. It would have to be made of materials not yet invented that can radiate that heat into space. Setting out on its journey, the spacecraft must navigate an obstacle course of interstellar objects. If it meets a meteor, it uses a battery of shields to pulverize the object and whisk it away. If the craft plows through a cloud of dust, it's buffered by a protective magnetic field. As it finally closes in on its target, it releases a probe, our cosmic envoy. Powered by its own antimatter engine, firing in reverse, the probe would need to spend years, even decades, slowing down. Even at these speeds, the mission is probably too long for any human to go along.
Imagine for a moment a future in which time and distance are not so daunting and the stars are literally at our fingertips. A spacecraft maneuvers into an orbital station in preparation for launch. It's a testament to science conceived on a stunning theoretical frontier with engineering far beyond what we know today. This craft is based on a mind-boggling discovery by Albert Einstein that gravity is the distortion of space by massive objects. What if a spaceship could manipulate this strange cosmic trait to pass between the folds of space and time? Such a spacecraft would run on exotic forms of matter not yet discovered and use the equivalent of all the electric power generated by the United States. Welcome to Warp Drive. In theory, this ship could go faster than light as it traverses the galaxy in a cosmic bubble. But don't book your flight just yet. Building a spacecraft like this will take breathtaking advances in science and technology. As far off as this may be, who can say what challenges human ingenuity will one day overcome? What ideas or technologies will propel us forward? When or if we do reach for the stars, the impulse will no doubt come not from a struggle to survive, but from a sense of wonder at the limitless variety of a living universe. The scene is hundreds or thousands of years in the future. A starship arrives at Proxima B or a similar destination. Whether the craft carries humans or not, we'll likely send an unmanned probe down to give us our first up-close look. It may well land using technologies we've perfected in our day, at the dawn of planetary exploration. Sensors will probe the alien landscape. Artificial intelligence that evolved and was updated during the journey 
will interpret the scene. What's the makeup of the planet's soil? Its atmosphere? Has life established a foothold? Steadily, a new world surrenders its secrets. With each revelation, we reflect on the odyssey that brought us here and how it began in the discoveries and dreams of generations long past. <laughs>